All right, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Uh, my name is Bola Zapor, and I'm Associate Professor in European Studies. And I would like to welcome you all uh, in my capacity as Director of the Treaty Center for Resistance Studies. And I would also like to welcome you all on behalf of the Trinity Long Room Hub, which provided home for, for the center and which, of course, very generously supports uh, events uh, like uh, this. Um, I would like to welcome our speaker today, and I'm absolutely delighted to welcome our speaker today, uh, Alicia Kromechuk. Uh, we are very grateful for you to, to make the trip over from uh, Dublin in such difficult and, and turbulent times. Uh, it really is an honour and a pleasure to, to have you here. I just say a few words about Alicia uh, uh, by way of introducing her and then oh, shut up and uh, disappear in the backstage and, and let her do the rest. Uh, um, there's a lot to uh, tell about her, but I won't uh, bore you with the details because uh, she has a very good website and you, you'll find everything, everything there. Uh, Alicia currently is the director of the Ukrainian uh, Institute in London since 2020. Uh, uh, as far as I know, the uh, Institute is a registered charity that organizes public facing events, I guess, like this, uh, but also educational activities and uh, and um, I think there's language training involved right. as well, as far as I know. And history, yeah. and culture, and literature. There you go. Everything. So, so, everything. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a holistic institute. Um, but but uh, basically, Alicia has trained as a historian, um, uh, and a historian of war uh, in, in particular. Uh, and her first book, called uh, Undetermined Ukrainians, Post-War Narratives of the Waffen ss uh, Galicia Division, uh, explored a very difficult uh, and controversial topic. I mean, those of you who have some familiarity or some knowledge of Eastern European historiographical debates or the memory wars that followed the collapse of communism would probably agree with me when I say that this required significant intellectual courage to write. Um, and I guess one uh, po possible lecture for the future would be about the responses to, to your book. Uh, in, uh, uh, in Ukraine and elsewhere, we'd be quite um, interested to hear about that. Uh, we can't do everything today. Um, uh, her most recent book uh, is a non-fiction, uh, but generally, she, I mean, as a historian, she focused on war, memory of war, gender, and gender-based violence. But most recently, uh, she published a, a non-fiction book called "The Death of a Soldier," told uh, by his uh, sister which is a gripping narrative about war, grief and loss uh, that kind of brings together, I guess, historical perspectives uh, and the insights of an academic with subjective representations of trauma uh, and loss. Uh, but Alicia is also uh, engaged um, with the public. She is a public speaker, public intellectual, if, if, if that's a word that we still like. Uh, she did all the big jobs for BBC, CNN, The Guardian, the Economist, and so on and so on. Again, I refer you to, to her website. They're all listed there, so you can see uh, all the interviews and the, and the articles. Uh, I guess one uh, article I would recommend uh, specifically would be her uh, article, I think it was in The Guardian, uh, called The Ukraine Fatigue, uh, which I think is a very timely and very interesting uh, article about um, with sort of reflection about um, the war and the international perception of the war uh, in Ukraine two years uh, after the full-scale invasion of Russia uh, and it has some uh, very interesting uh, and thought-provoking insights about, about the, uh, the future as well. So I sort of, uh, highly recommend that article to you as well. But at the same time, uh, uh, Olesi is also or used to have a career in acting. Um, she, she founded uh, an acting group in, uh, in London, which is a dormant, I think, uh, is a, would be a way of putting it at the moment, temporarily. Um, and they, they performed adaptations, um, uh, mostly uh, by Ukrainian authors uh, and so on. Um, right, I, I really can't really think of a better person uh, in this part of the world uh, to talk to you about courage, justice uh, and resistance in Ukraine. So without further ado, I would like to invite Alicia Kravetschuk to give us what she has to say. Thank you so much, Balash. Thank you, Trinity College Dublin. Thank you, Centre for Resistance Studies. Thank you to all of you for coming here tonight to hear me speak. And thank you, 
uh, first of all, for keeping Ukraine at the center of your attention. When it disappears from the headlines, it's tempting to think that the war is over. The war is far from being over, and it requires um, our joint effort to, to make sure that it does end in sustainable, lasting peace, not just in Ukraine, but for the rest of uh, Europe. And that is something that I'll be talking to you about today. Most of the thoughts that I'll share with you today uh, are published in different publications already. So those of you who have read some of my work will recognize some of what I'm talking about. But the good news is um, what I'm saying tonight is uh, in its unedited version before the editors had their say in what should or shouldn't be printed. Um, I'd like to treat this talk as an invitation for an open and honest discussion. Um, honesty and responsibility are not as highly featured in scholarly work as balance and objectivity. Uh, and I think that's a pity. I think that it is something that we should be embracing as scholars and also something we should be teaching to our students, especially if we want to truly uh, reform, uh, decolonize, de-imperialize uh, our field and uh, stop multiplying misconceptions that we've had to deal with um, up until now. Okay. Like a pretty young woman who gets murdered at the start of a crime novel, Ukraine became an object of interest because of an act of aggression directed against it. It has gained visibility around the globe because Russia has tried to render it invisible. Being seen, however, is not the same as being understood. To truly understand Ukraine, we need to listen to Ukrainians talk about themselves in their own words and on their own terms. We need to trust them with the knowledge of themselves and question our own, often imperialist, perceptions of the world. After all, it is the habit of listening to the great power that has made us preoccupied with the perpetrator when we should be focusing on the nations that it attacks. It has led us to mistake Russia for the country that we wish it to be, rather than the one that it really is, and pushed us to direct our energies towards ensuring Russia's survival, rather than planning for its demise. Almost every time I'm invited to speak about Ukraine, I hope it's not going to be the case tonight, I notice an unfailing pattern of discussion. Sooner or later, usually sooner, someone asks me about Russia. Why is the Russian army performing so poorly, rather than why the Ukrainian army has been performing so well against the odds? What will it take for Russian society to take to the streets and protest, rather than what has made Ukrainians so intolerant of authoritarianism and determined to fight against it? What will happen to the Russian language now that even Russophone Ukrainians refuse to speak it, rather than how it was possible that the Ukrainian language managed to survive and even thrive in spite of centuries of Russification. And finally, will the post-Putin leadership, whatever that might be, save Russia, rather than what we can all do to make sure that Ukraine is saved from this and future genocidal attacks? This lack of understanding of Ukraine's subjectivity its history and vision of the future meant that at least, at least until February 2022, for much of the world, Ukraine was not a country, but a territory. A land that could be fought over, divided, and controlled by others. A buffer zone. Buffer zones, in our imagination, don't have clear identities. We don't sympathize with the people who inhabit them in the same way as we do with places that come to mean something to us through knowledge that we acquire about them. In other words, it's easy to turn a buffer zone into a war zone. And this perception of the country outside of Ukraine has frequently been shaped through the eyes of Moscow and found especially fertile ground in those cultures that themselves had an imperial past and thus gave credibility to another empire more willingly than to the subaltern. It penetrated the media, the political sphere, and academia, and this had real-life consequences. The way Ukraine is written about, thought of, taught, is the way it will be imagined and understood by the political elites, journalists, diplomats, the army, and others who communicate their knowledge to the general population. Two years into the full-scale war, 
and 10 years since Russia started its aggression against Ukraine, you'd think our understanding of the country would be different. It has certainly improved, that is true, but we still have a very long way to go. There's still a gaping hole in university curricula when it comes to the study of Ukraine. Grassroots initiatives that secured some funding to offer fellowships for scholars at risk are now drying up, and the management in most higher education institutions hasn't made it their priority to set up centers, chairs, or at least long-term positions in Ukrainian studies. In the two years of the full-scale war, there was one lectureship in Ukrainian advertised in the UK last month. Needless to say, several new posts in Russian studies appeared over the same period. In Britain, there is a handful of places where Ukrainian history, politics, and culture are taught. Two, only two universities um, have Ukrainian programs, and only one offers a degree in Ukrainian studies. It's a pitiful sight for a country that prides itself on dealing with its own imperial past. Failing to shift our focus from an imperial center to the region that it oppressed will hinder our efforts to decolonize our knowledge. Do you know which author I reread after the 24th of February 2022? I hear a man ask a question in a way that implies that he anticipates being praised for his choice. I have a feeling that I won't like the answer, so I don't say anything in response. Dostoevsky says the man who specializes in European culture. I'm still silent. He didn't get the expected gratification, so he goes on to explain his decision. I needed to understand the Russian society, how they came to wage such a war, he adds. And what Ukrainian author did you read to understand why Ukrainians are resisting so? I ask in return. It's his turn to be silent. The misunderstanding of Ukraine and the lack of critical assessment of Russia has played a crucial role in the unfolding of this war. Russia's cultivation of its image abroad, attained through soft power, disinformation, and the manipulation of individuals and institutions via bribes and blackmail, has secured the enduring admiration of the West for the so-called great Russian culture. As a result, it succeeded in overshadowing the voices that would offer a different perception of the region. We have primarily gained our understanding of East Central Europe, of Central Asia, and North Caucasus from the perspectives provided by Moscow. In other words, we've given heed to the oppressor instead of seeking out the perspectives of the oppressed. Russia enjoyed authority, credibility, and impunity over the years it's been waging the war in Ukraine. It benefited from the crimes that it committed. In the meantime, the voices on the receiving end of the cultural, economic, and finally military violence that it inflicted were largely dismissed to the point that Ukraine was predicted to fall in three days when Russia started its full-scale invasion. Now, two years on, Ukraine continues to stand strong. But it also continues to be mistrusted, especially when it comes to its view of what constitutes victory. The less we trust it with its experience, needs, and choices, the more we contribute to the prolongation of the war. We must stop treating Ukraine as a buffer zone. We also need to remember that it is more than a war zone. It has become a war zone precisely because it was invisible to the rest of the world for so long and pushed to the margins of our imagination. How can it be reimagined as it is fighting for its survival? We need to develop a language that is rooted in the experience of oppression and can thus speak authoritatively about its emancipatory fight. And more importantly, we need to ensure that this voice, which isn't immediately recognized as authoritative, authoritative because it does, not, it does not produce by the imperial center and brings from the margins instead, is trusted with its experience. There is a growing body of English language literature on Ukraine and Russia's war against it. Frequently, it is written by those with established profiles in the global north. While expert voices that are not rooted in Ukraine can certainly be of great value, not least because of the distance that they enjoy, um, and, and it brings a different perspective, it should be our priority to amplify the ones that speak from inside the country. Yet even when it comes to Ukrainian voices, 
that are deemed authoritative, they often belong to great men, such as President Volodymyr Zelensky and army generals. Their words have proved to be effective in making the invisible visible. However, we must now seek out narratives that can make the visible understood. And these narratives are likely to challenge our preconceived ideas of Ukraine. And by doing so, add a layer of knowledge that is vital if we want to go beyond the headlines. So in the remaining time of my talk, I'd like to share three stories of Ukrainian women. And I hope their voices can help us gain a more in-depth view of what Ukraine is now. Natalia. I asked the receptionist at the Lviv Hotel I was staying in if she had any sellotape I could borrow. I had an important package to deliver, and it was crucial for it to be well wrapped. The woman handed her stationery set to me, and I perched on the edge of the chair in the hotel lobby to get on with my mission. The package I was wrapping could not be sent by ordinary mail. I had to deliver it personally because its destination was in the world of the dead. Having ensured that the parcel was what, as waterproof as possible, I returned the tape to, and the scissors to the receptionist, jumped in a taxi, and headed to the Luchakiv Cemetery, the main burial ground in the city of Lviv, my hometown. When Russia started its war against Ukraine in 2014, the military section of the cemetery was expanded with the graves of the new war dead. I'm very familiar with the large granite crosses featuring photos of the fallen and the golden engraving to the eternal memory of the hero. One of them bears the name and a photo of my brother, Volodya, killed in action in 2017. His grave is the first and the last place I visit on my trips to Ukraine. In fact, any spare moment I have, I spend there. It's the only place where the wound in my heart bleeds a little less. This time, however, as soon as the taxi dropped me off at the cemetery, I didn't go to my brother's grave. I headed straight to an adjacent area with an apt name, the Field of Mars. The Soviets buried their military dead there after they had annexed Western Ukraine in the aftermath of the Second World War. Before that, this field had contained the remains of soldiers of the Austrian army killed in the Great War. When Russia escalated its war in 2022, the war dead were too great in numbers to be contained in the military pantheon where my brother is laid to rest. They started to be buried in the field of Mars. Holding hundreds of new graves and counting, this spillover burial is now larger than the original, the original pantheon. As I approached the field, I was overwhelmed by the sheer number of new graves, a sea of flags and burning candles behind, beside them. There were many more than the last time I had visited a few months earlier. My package was to be delivered to one of them. I didn't know the man who was buried there. I knew that his name was Andri. I also knew that his last name was the same as that of his sister, although I didn't know her personally either. One night, while watching the news at home in London, I saw her interviewed beside her, brother, beside her brother's grave and recognized the spot, the field of Mars, in my hometown. I also recognized the feeling she was conveying she said she would never forgive the Russians for her brother's death. The package I was delivering was for Natalia, a fellow grieving sister. My book, The Death of a Soldier Told by His Sister, had just come out in Ukrainian, and I wanted her to have it, hoping that it might soothe her pain, or at least, failing that, remind her that she was not alone. As I couldn't find Natalia online, my only option was to leave my book wrapped in as much plastic as the autumn weather called for, in one place I knew she'd visit, her brother's final resting place. When I located Andrei's grave, I noticed it was overflowing with flowers. I was sure Natalia must visit it often. I tucked my book in between, the, in between flower beds together with a message of apologies for intruding into her grief. Around 80% of Ukrainians know someone who had been either killed or injured in Russia's war. In addition to the military losses, there are mounting civilian casualties from Russia's relentless strikes on schools, kindergartens, hospitals, and ordinary residential buildings. Whole communities are destroyed. Mariupol, Bakhmut, Popasna, Bobizhne, Adivka, these are all ghost, all ghost towns. 
Almost 4 million individuals are internally displaced and another 6 million Ukrainians have sought refuge globally. Many have lost con contact with their loved ones. PTSD and other types of trauma are widespread and will pose a cha challenge not only for war veterans but for the whole of society. Ukraine is a country that is drowning in grief. But the grief only fuels the fight. Ukrainians are not protected by defensive alliances um, other than those that they create themselves. The Ukrainian armed forces are an embodiment of an alliance between society and the military. The army relies on the hard work of a vast volunteer movement to fill the gaps in procurement. Friends and families of those who serve regularly raise funds for various items ranging from drones to first aid kits. The army also relies on civilians for its recruits. Therefore, a military death often means the killing of someone who was a, uh, who was a civilian only yesterday. High losses in the army mean that more civilians will have to take up arms tomorrow. The Ukrainian armed forces are a citizen army. A large proportion of it consists of people from all walks of, lives, of life who either voluntarily joined or were drafted for service during the different waves of mobilization since 2014 and especially after February 2022. These men and women took up arms not out of professional choice, but out of sheer necessity. They gave up their civilian lives to protect the lives of their loved ones and to ensure that Ukrainians could choose the democratic future they had been building and not the one an authoritarian occupier wishes to impose on them. In the interview Natalia gave beside her brother's grave, she said that she had tried to prevent him from joining up, but he had insisted on fighting. She tried to protect him from death. Instead, he died while protecting his country. I don't know if Natalia found my book. If she did, I can only hope that it provided some solace to her. Antiana. Mom, remember when we were a family and when we loved each other? Andriana Arechta, a special unit sergeant in the Ukrainian armed forces, relays a conversation she had with her son. Interviewed for a BBC documentary, she is struggling to hold back her tears. It's been months since she held her little boy. At the time of the interview, Andriana was convalescing in a military hospital, following severe injuries sustained in action. Her unit did not have an armored vehicle and was relying on a civilian car sourced by the volunteers. So when it drove over a landmine near Kherson in 2022, she didn't have the protection an armored vehicle would provide and was lucky to have survived the blast. Andriana is well known in Ukraine as one of the founders of the women's veteran movement. She has been demonized in Russia as a Nazi executioner, a World War II term used by the Soviets to describe the Nazi death squads. I know Andriana as a shy but utterly determined woman. I met her in 2018 when she came to the UK to promote Invisible Battalion, a documentary film about the lives of women on the front lines. During this period, Many around the globe succumbed to the Kremlin propaganda about the so-called internal conflict in eastern Ukraine and chose to regard Russia as a mediator for peace rather than the perpetrator of war. The service women therefore had to do some basic explaining about the war, its origins and its likely escalation before they were able to talk about the gendered nature of their service. Andriana was a perfect ambassador for this purpose. She joined the volunteer battalion straight after the Maidan protests in 2014, when it turned out that it wasn't enough to defend democracy on the barricades. It had to also be defended on the battlefield. She served as a shock trooper, but was formally registered as a seamstress. The paternalistic legacy of the Soviet labor law prevented women from accessing a vast majority of army occupations. However, the need for all professions at the front was immense. And so the women were placed in those jobs that needed to be done, even if on paper their involvement was limited to the rear. Invisible Battalion grew into a powerful advocacy campaign spearheaded by a group of women veterans and feminist scholars. They assessed the precarious position of women in the armed forces and lobbied for the law to be amended. The result was astonishing. Not only was the law revised, 
the efforts, the activists, um, the efforts of the activists also drew attention to the gendered perception of service in Ukraine. In the early years of the war, media coverage seemed to oscillate between sensationalizing women who followed their men to the trenches and demonizing the ones who should have known that war was not a place for women. Invisible battalion activists challenged this misperception and insisted on judging women in the military by their accomplishments rather than their gender. Through their efforts, they succeeded in gradually altering both media depictions and societal attitudes towards service women. Andriana was among those active in the campaign. While fighting against obstacles that prevented her and her fellow service women from ser serving unhindered by structural and habitual discrimination, she realized, however, that her biggest adversary was the misogynistic enemy. Aware of the numerous accounts of torture and sexual violence against women in Russian captivity, Andriana chose her nom de guerre carefully. She was known as Malish, kid. Using the noun in masculine form meant that if communication mentioning her was intercepted by the Russians or their proxies, they wouldn't necessarily suspect a woman to be a female fighter. The Russian army uses rape as a method of warfare. The extent of conflict-related sexual violence prevent, perpetrated by Russian troops became clear to the world only in 2022, following the liberation of the occupied regions, which exposed the magnitude of the crimes. Ukrainians knew what to expect from the escalation of the war. They were aware of their citizens in occupied Crimea and in parts of eastern Ukraine who had been deprived of all basic rights by the occupying authorities for years. That is why, following the full-scale invasion, not only men, but thousands of women joined the armed forces. Some were motivated by the need to be armed should the enemy approach their homes, while others felt a strong sense of duty to defend their country. Whatever the reasons for joining the ranks, as of October 2023, over 62,000 women were enlisted in the Ukrainian army. Over 43,000 of them were service women. In contrast to the presence of women in the armed forces in 2014, there has been an almost 25% overall increase, with the number of service women more than doubling. Having taken her son to safety in February 2022, Andriana joined the military. I've lost more than 100 friends. I don't even know how many phone numbers I need to delete, she tells the BBC crew. They took the best years of my life, she adds. They even took my dreams. In spite of her grave injuries, Andriana is determined to make full recovery and return to the front. She is determined to go on fighting, so her son won't have to. Victoria. In public discussions, I am frequently asked why Ukrainians are so focused on achieving victory and justice rather than ceasefire and peace. Despite being the ones losing their citizens, Ukrainians remain determined to fight for as long as it takes. This question typically comes from individuals who do not understand that Moscow is a repressive imperialist power that is not interested in playing by the rules of a democratic order. <laughs> In order to maintain at least an appearance of its imperial might, it has to constantly expand its borders, turning sovereign states in its neighborhood into a buffer zone. The only way to secure peace with it is to defeat it. So far, Russia has gotten away with perpetrating crimes not only in Ukraine, but also in Chechnya, Georgia, Syria, and other parts of the world where its mercenaries operate. It has benefited from the impunity granted to it by world leaders who continued to trade with the aggressor and thus facilitated its ability to wage wars. The testimonies of those who record Russian war crimes and speak out against its impunity are vital if we are to break the pattern of aggression and bring the perpetrators to justice. That is why the invading Russian army was equipped with a hit list of activists when it staged a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. The occupying Russian troops brought not only parade uniforms with them at the beginning of the invasion, but they also brought body bags, said Ukrainian author Victoria Melina, 
while being interviewed at Hay Festival in January 2023. They expected to take Ukraine in three days and were pretty sure that those body bags and we are pretty sure that those body bags were for writers, for mayors, for people whom we see tortured and murdered in the occupied territories, she added. In June 2023, Victoria was killed in a Russian missile strike on a restaurant. Following her death, her colleagues at Penn Ukraine started a project on people of culture killed in Russia's war. Victoria's story is now added to their somber database. A novelist, poet, and children's book writer, Victoria trained herself to become a war crimes investigator following Russia's full-scale invasion. She traveled around liberated territories and spoke to survivors of the occupation. She was determined to document their testimonies of war crimes because lies thrive on untold truths. Victoria wrote that when stories such as those of the Holocaust or the Holodomor are not fully revealed, we're bound to, tr to not trust each other. Who were you? The hungry one or the one taking all the food in 1933? The scared one watching from the window when Jews were taken away or the one who took them in? The questions Victoria poses remain relevant today. Who were we in 2014? The ones who tolerated Russia's aggression and turned a blind eye to the violation of international law in the middle of Europe, or the ones who pushed against Russia's impunity? Who were we in 2022? The ones who claimed Ukraine would fall in three days, or the ones who campaigned to provide, provide it with all that it needed to withstand the attack? Who will we be as this war continues? The ones who will insist on a ceasefire that will bring more body bags for the next wave of escalation? Or will we be the ones who will stay invested in Ukraine's victory so that its people can see justice and begin to heal? Natalia, Andriana, and Victoria represent the experiences of many Ukrainians, the shared trauma from increasing losses, the unwavering determination for victory and the yearning for justice as the key to lasting peace are prevalent throughout society. What is lacking is trust in the democratic world. Is it prepared to do all it takes to see Ukraine succeed and thus protect democracy globally? From the field of Mars, I went to visit Victoria's grave. She is also buried in the Lachakiv Cemetery. I brought with me a bookie I received after a talk at a book festival. She should have been at that festival too. She should have received the flowers from her readers too. I left my bookie on her grave and went to the military pantheon to pay respects to my brother because it's the only place where the wound in my heart bleeds a little less. If you were 30% braver, what would you do to be a better ancestor? An enthusiastic facilitator posed this icebreaker question to a room full of con conference delegates in, in New York. I'm not a big fan of such exercises. I do my thinking in silence and solitude on my own terms and at my own pace. But the facilitator was determined to break the ice. Take 60 seconds to think and share your answers with, in your small groups. My small group consisted of democracy activists from different parts of the world. They were eager to discuss their opinions on courage and legacy. I'd spend more time with my kids, said one. I'd dedicate myself to the work I love rather than that which I must do, said another. I would speak to people I disagree with more often, said man opposite me. That was a good one, I thought. After all, the theme of our conference was democracy. I kept quiet hoping no one would notice. You're being quiet, said one of them, when everyone else had spoken. They did notice. My small group turned their heads towards me with curiosity and anticipation. Oh, I don't know. It's a difficult question. I tried to get myself out of the trap. I need more time to think about it. The thing is, I don't need any time to think about it. As soon as the facilitator finished that question, my answer was right there, staring me in the face. Now that my small group was staring at me just as insistently, I couldn't face sharing my answer, my thoughts with them. It seemed like I needed to be 30% braver just to utter the, the answer. 
If I were braver to be a better ancestor, I'd join the army, the Ukrainian armed forces. At that moment, it was the only answer that rang true. My response was met with the sort of uncomfortable silence I seem to bring to most social conversations. A friend of mine, Sasha Dobzhik, found a good term for that, a Ukrainian killjoy. It applies to those of us, I hear some laughter, some, some more Ukrainian killjoys in the audience, yes. It applies to those of us who keep talking about the war when people want to talk about their kids, about the future, and all those wonderful things that give us hope. Sometimes we don't even need to offer a digest of Russia's recent bombardments. We end conversations just by entering the room. When people think of Ukraine these days, they think of war, destruction, death, weapons, the need to produce and provide more weapons. Such thoughts bring little inspiration. And so when asked about, uh, to speak about, about Ukraine on international platforms, I am frequently encouraged to speak of peace, reconstruction, and reconciliation. A relentless fight with no end in sight is a conversation killer. It's also the reality in which most Ukrainians have been living since the start of the full-scale invasion. Ukraine is a bleeding wound on the body of Europe. The international community has been complicit in this hemorrhage by tolerating the aggressor who inflicted the injury. As the wound extended for hundreds of miles and posed the risk of staining neighboring regions with its fresh, sticky blood, the world started slipping into denial of its existence, instead of promptly applying the remedies necessary for healing. A perilous decision. The bleeding of one part will, inevi will inevitably lead to the weakening of the whole. Ukraine was never given enough support to win. The assistance it received was vital to survive, crucial to keep going, necessary not to lose, but it wasn't sufficient to win. It turned out that one thing that was truly in short supply was courage. Not that of people of Ukraine, they had no choice but to be brave. It was the leaders of what is known as the free world that needed to be 30% braver to put an end to this war, a real end. Not a temporary ceasefire which territorial concessions might bring, not a stalemate in the war of attrition, the sort of end that could only come with Ukraine's victory, which would include the restoration of territorial integrity violated by Russia in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea, the dispensation of justice for the numerous crimes committed by the Russian troops and their leadership, and the provision of the type of security guarantees that would make a new wave of Russian aggression impossible. Our freedom is already fragile. Wherever we see a crack in our democratic order, we can be sure to find Russia's fingerprints all over it. Russia's victory in Ukraine would be nothing less than the defeat of democracy around the world. As we consider how to be better ancestors, we might wish to start by being better neighbors, better citizens, if not out of the feeling of solidarity, then at least out of an instinct for self-preservation. We have the power to elect political representatives who can enact changes that will outlast their time in office. We need to support politicians who view Russia's war not as an inconvenience to their economies, but to understand that tolerance of a warmongering state is what led us to the situation in the first place. We need to hold accountable those leaders who allowed Russia to enjoy impunity after 2014, who benefited from continued business with the aggressive country and thus contributed to the escalation in 2022. Crucially, we must wake up from the slumber of inaction. This war is existential not only for Ukrainians. It is existential for those of us who want to live in a world governed not by brutal force, but by the rule of law. Ukrainians are being killed in a fight for freedom. We are witnessing their deaths. With every Ukrainian death, our own freedom diminishes. With every ruined Ukrainian city, our democracy gets chiseled away. We can stop this erosion by sending Ukraine the aid that it needs, the weapons, the air defense, and the support that its people have been asking from day one. If we don't win this fight for democracy in Ukraine, we'll end up fighting for it closer to home. Let us then do, do all in our, the, in our power to help Ukrainians win the fight not only for their freedom, but also ours. 
The current existential fight requires the mobilization of the whole of society, inside and outside the country. Something Ukrainians have shown from the very early days of the full-scale uh, full war. But the victory also requires international solidarity for our freedom and yours. I'd hate to see my adopted country society or any other people around the world down their civilian tools because they feel that the only way for them left to protect their loved ones, their statehood, and their basic human rights was with weapons in their hands. The sooner my fellow West Europeans and the international community find the courage to support Ukraine's victory, the longer they'll be able to enjoy the privileges that civilian life has to offer. Ukrainians no longer have the privilege to choose whether to be 30% braver or not. That choice was taken away by Russia. They must be brave in order to survive. The rest of us still have that choice, and we had better make it soon. Thank you. Thank you.